Ready Player One, Chapter 5. After lunch, I headed to my favorite class, Advanced Oasis Studies. This was a senior year elective where you learned about the history of the Oasis and its creators. Talk about an easy A. For the past five years, I devoted all my free time to learning as much as I possibly could about James Halliday. I had exhaustively studied his life, accomplishments, accomplishments, and interests. Over a dozen different Halliday biographies had been published in the years since his death, and I'd read all of them. Several documentary films had also been made about him, and I'd studied those too. I studied every word Holiday had ever written. I had played every video game he, he'd ever made. I took notes, writing down every detail I thought might relate to the hunt. I kept everything in a notebook, which I started to call my Grail Diary, after watching the third Indiana Jones film. I'd, the more I'd learned about Holiday's life, the more I'd grown to idolize him. He was a god among geeks, a nerd uber deity on the level of Gygax, Garriott, and Gates. He left home after high school with nothing but his wits and his imagination, and he'd used them to attain worldwide fame and amass a vast fortune. He created an entirely new reality that now provided an escape for the most of humanity. On, and to top it all off, he turned his last will and testament into the greatest video game contest of all time. I spent most of my time in Oasis Studies class annoying our teacher, Mr. Siders, by pointing out errors in our textbook and raising my hand to interject some relevant bit of holiday trivia that I, and I alone, thought was interesting. After the first few weeks of class, Mr. Siders had stopped calling on me unless no one else knew the answer to his question. Today, he was reading excerpts from The Eggman, a best-selling holiday biography that I'd already read four times. During his lecture, I kept having to resist the urge of interrupting him and point out all of the really important details that the book left out. Instead, I just made a mental note of each omission as Mr. Siders began to recount the circumstances of Halliday's childhood. I once again tried to glean whatever secrets I could from the strange way Halliday had lived his life and from the odd clues about himself he had chosen to leave behind. James Donovan Holiday was born June 12, 1972 in Middletown, Ohio. He was an only child. His father was an alcoholic machine operator, and his mother was a bipolar waitress. By all accounts, James was a bright boy, but socially inept. He had an extremely different time, difficult time communicating with other people around him. Despite his obvious intelligence, he did poorly in school because most of his attention was focused on computers, comic books, sci-fi and fantasy novels, movies, and above all else, video games. One day in junior high, Halliday was alone in the cafeteria reading a Dungeons & Dragons player's manual. The game fascinated him, but he'd never yet actually played it, because he'd never had any friends to play it with. A boy in his class that named Ogden Morrow noticed that Halliday was reading what was what Halliday was reading and invited him to attend one of his weekly D&D gaming sessions at his house. There, in Morrow's basement, Halliday was introduced to an entire group of mega geeks, just like himself. They immediately accepted him as one of their own, and for the first time in his life, James Halliday had a circle of friends. Ogden Morrow eventually became Halliday's business partner, collaborator, collaborator, and best friend. Many would liken the pairing of Morrow and Halliday to that of Jobs and Wozniak, or Lennon and McCarthy. It was a partnership destined to alter the course of human history. At age 15, Halliday created his first video game, Anorax Quest. He programmed it in BASIC on the TRS-80 color computer he'd received the previous Christmas, though he'd asked his parents for a slightly more expensive Commodore 64. Anorak's quest was an adventure set in Chthonia, the fantasy world Halliday had created for his high school Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Anorak was the nickname Halliday had been given by a female British exchange student in his high, at his high school. He liked the name Anorak so much he'd used it for his favorite D&D character, the, most power, the powerful wizard he lit, who later appeared in many of his video games. Halliday created Anorax Quest for fun to share with the guys in his D&D gaming group. They all found the game addictive and lost countless hours attempting to solve its intricate puzzles and riddles. Ogden Morrow convinced Halliday that Anorax Quest was better than most of the computer games currently on the market and encouraged him to try selling it. He, hoped Halliday, he helped Halliday create some of the simple cover artwork for the game and together the two of them hand copied Anorax Quest onto dozens of five and a quarter floppy disks. I stuck them into Ziploc bags along with a single photocopied sheet of instructions. 
They began selling the game on the software rack at their local computer store. Before long, they couldn't make copies fast enough to meet demand. Marl and Holiday decided to start their own video game company, Gregarious Games, which initially operated out of Morrow's basement. Holiday programmed new versions of Anrax Quest for the Atari 800XL, Apple II, and Commodore 64 computers, and Morrow began placing ads for the game in the back of several computer magazines. Within six months, Anrax Quest became a national bestseller. Holiday and Morrow almost didn't graduate from high school because they spent most of their senior year working on Anorex Quest 2, and instead of going off to college, they both focused all their energy on their new company, which has now grown too large for Morrow's basement. In 1990, Gregarious Games moved into its first real office, located in a rundown strip mall in Columbus, Ohio. Over the next decade, the company took video game industry by storm, releasing a series of best-selling action and adventure games, all using a groundbreaking first-person graphics engine Created by Holiday, Gregarious Games, but yeah, uh, let me redo that one. Over the next decade, the small company took the video game industry by storm, releasing a series of best-selling action and adventure games, all using the groundbreaking first-person graphics engine created by Holiday. Gregarious Games set a new standard for immersive gaming, and every time they released a new title, <clears throat> it pushed the envelope of what seemed possible for the computer hardware available at the time. The rotund Ogden Morrow was naturally charismatic, and he handled all the company's business affairs and public relations. At every Gregarious Games press conference, Morrow grinned infectiously from behind his unruly beard and wire-rimmed glasses, using his natural gift for hype and hyperbole. Halliday seemed to be Morrow's polar opposite in every way. He was tall, gaunt, and painfully shy. He preferred to stay out of the limelight. People enjoyed Gregarious Games during this period, People employed by Gregarious Games during this period say that Halliday frequently locked himself in his office, where he programmed incessantly, often going without food, sleep, or human contact for days or even weeks. On the few occasions that Halliday agreed to do interviews, his behavior came off as bizarre, even by game designer standards. He was hyper, hyperkinetic, aloof, and, social, and so socially inept that interviewers often came away with the impression that he was mentally ill. Holiday tended to speak so rapidly that his words were often unintelligible, and he had a disturbingly high, disturbing high-pitched voice, made him more so because he was usually the only one who knew what he was laughing about. When Halliday got bored during an interview or conversation, he'd usually get up and walk off without saying a word. Holiday had many well-known obsessions. Chief among them were classic video games, sci-fi, fantasy novels, and movies of all genres. He also had an extreme fixation on the 1980s, a decade in which he'd been a teenager. Halliday seemed to expect everyone around him to share his obsessions, and he often lashed out at those who didn't. He was known for to fire longtime employees for not recognizing like, an obscure line of movie dialogue he quoted, or if he discovered that they weren't familiar with one of his favorite cartoons, comics, or video games. Ogden Morrow would usually, usually hire the employees back, without Halliday ever noticing. As the years went on, Halliday's already stunted social skills seemed to deteriorate even further. Several exhaustive psychological studies were done on Holiday following his death, and his obsessive adherence to routine and preoccupation with a few obscure areas of interest led many psychologists to conclude that Halliday had suffered from Asperger's syndrome or another or from some other form of high functioning autism. Despite his ex eccentricity, eccentricities, no one ever questioned Holiday's genius. The games he created were addictive and wildly popular. By the end of the 20th century, Holiday was widely recognized as the greatest video game designer of his generation, and some would argue of all time. Ogden Morrow was a brilliant programmer in his own right, but his true talent was his knack for business. In addition to collaborating on the company's games, he was the mastermind of all their early marketing campaigns and shareware distribution schemes, with astounding results. When Gregarious Games finally went public, their stock immediately shot into the stratosphere. By their 30th birthdays, Halliday and Morrow were both multimillionaires. They purchased mansions on the same street. Morrow bought a Lamborghini, took several long vacations, and traveled the world. 
Halliday bought and restored one of the original DeLoreans used in Back to the Future films. He continued to spend nearly all his time welded to a computer keyboard and used his newfound wealth to amass what would eventually become the world's largest private collection of classic video games, Star Wars action figures, vintage lunch boxes, and comic books. At the height of its success, Gregarious Games appeared to fall dormant. Several years elapsed during which they released no new games. Morrow made cryptic announcements saying the company was working on an ambitious project that would move, to an, move them in an entirely new direction. Rumors began to circulate that Gregarious Games was developing some sort of new computer gaming hardware and that this secret project was rapidly exhausting the company's considerable financial resources. There were also indications that both Halliday and Morrow had invested most of their own personal fortunes in the company's new endeavor. Word began to spread that Gregarious Games was in danger of going bankrupt. Then, in December 2012, Gregarious Games rebranded itself as Gregarious Simulation Systems, and under this new banner, they launched their flagship product, the only product GSS would ever release, the Oasis, the ontologically anthropocentric sensory immersive simulation. The Oasis would have been ultimately change the way people around the world lived, worked, and commun communicated. It would transform entertainment, social networking, and even global politics. Even though it was initially marketed as a new kind of massively multiplayer online game, the Oasis quickly evolved into a new way of life. In the days before the Oasis, massively multiplayer online games, MMOs, were among the first shared synthetic environments. They allowed thousands of players to simultaneously coexist inside of a simulated world, which they connected to via the internet. The overall size of the environments was relatively small, usually just a single world, or a dozen or so small planets. MMO players could see these online environments through a small two-dimensional window, their desktop computer monitor, and they could only interact with it by using keyboards, mice, and other crude input devices. Gregarious simulation systems elevated the MMO concept to an entirely new level. The Oasis didn't limit users to just one planet, or even a dozen. The Oasis contained hundred, hundreds of planets, and eventually thousands, of high-resolution 3D worlds for people to explore. And each one was beautifully rendered in meticulous graphic, graphical detail, right down to the bugs and blades of grass, wind and weather patterns. Users could circumnavigate each of these planets and never see the same terrain twice. Even at its first primitive incarnation, the scope of the simulation was staggering. Halliday and Morrow referred to the Oasis as an open-source reality, a malle malleable online universe that anyone could access by the internet, using their existing home computer or video game console. You could log in and instantly escape the drudgery of your day-to-day -day life. You could create an entirely new persona for yourself with complete control over how you worked and sounded to others. In the Oasis, the fat could become thin, the ugly could become beautiful, the shy extroverted, or vice versa. You could change your name, age, sex, race, height, weight, voice, hair color, and bone structure. Or you could cease being human altogether and become an elf, ogre, alien, or any other creature from literature, movies, or mythology. In the Oasis, you become whoever and whatever you wanted to be, without ever revealing your true identity, because your anonymity was guaranteed. Users could also alter the content of their virtual worlds inside the Oasis, or create entirely new ones. A person's online presence was no longer limited to a website or a social networking profile. In the Oasis, you could create your own private planet, build a virtual mansion on it, furnish and decorate it however you liked, and invite a few thousand friends over for a party, and those friends could be in different time zones spread out all over the globe. The keys to the success of the Oasis were the two new pieces of interface hardware that GSS created, both of which were required to access the simulation, the Oasis Visor and Haptic Gloves. The wireless one-size-fits-all Oasis Visor was slightly larger than a pair of sunglasses. It used harmless, low-powered lasers to draw the, the stunningly real environment of the Oasis right onto the wearer's retinas, completely immersing their entire field of vision in, an, in the online world. The visor was light years ahead of its clunky virtual reality goggles available prior to that time, and it, was rep and it represented a paradigm shift in the virtual reality technology. 
as did the lightweight Oasis haptic gloves, which allowed users to directly control the hands of their avatar and interact with their simulated environments as if they were actually inside of it. When you picked up objects, opened doors, or operated vehicles, the haptic gloves made you feel these non-existent objects and surfaces as if they were really right there in front of you. The gloves let you, as the television ads put it, reach in and touch the Oasis. Working together, the visor and the gloves made entering the Oasis an experience unlike anything else available. And once people got a taste of it, there was no going back. The software that powered the simulation, Holiday's new Oasis Reality Engine, was also represented a huge technological breakthrough. It managed to overcome limitations that plagued previous simulated realities. In addition to restricting the overall size of their virtual environments, earlier MMOs had been forced to limit their virtual populations, usually to a few thousand users per server. If too many people were logged on at the same time, the simulation would slow to a crawl and avatars would freeze in mid-stride as systems struggled to keep up. But the Oasis utilized a new kind of fault-tolerant server array that could draw additional processing power from every computer connected to it. At the time of its initial launch, the Oasis could handle up to 5 million simultaneous users with no discernible latency and no chance of system crash. A massive marketing campaign promoted the launch of the Oasis. The pervasive television, billboard, and internet ads featuring a lush green Oasis complete with palm trees and a pool of crystal blue water surrounded on all sides by a vast barren desert. GSS's new endeavor was a massive success from day one. The Oasis was what people have been dreaming of for decades. The virtual reality that had been promised for so long was finally here. And it was even better than they had imagined. The Oasis was an online utopia, a holodeck for the home. And its biggest selling point, it was free. Most online games of the day generated revenue by charging the users a monthly subscription fee for access. GSS only charged a one-time sign-up fee of 25 cents, for which he received the Oasis, received a lifetime Oasis account. The ads of all, the ads all use the same tagline: "The Oasis, the greatest video game ever created," and it only costs a quarter. At the time. At the time of uh, drastic social and cultural upheaval, when most of the world's population longed for an escape from reality, the Oasis provided it in a form that was cheap, legal, safe, and not medically proven to be addictive. The ongoing energy crisis contributed greatly to the Oasis' runaway popularity. The skyrocketing cost of oil made airline and automobile travel too expensive for the average citizen, and the Oasis became the only gateway People could afford. As, an, as the era of cheap, abundant energy grew to a close, poverty and unrest began to spread like a virus. Every day, more and more people had reason to seek solace inside Holiday's and Morrow's virtual utopia. Any business that wanted to set up shop inside the Oasis had to rent and purchase, or purchase virtual real estate, which Morrow dubbed as surreal estate from GSS. Anticipating this, the company had set aside uh, Sector 1 of the simulation's design designated business zone and began to sell and rent millions of blocks of the surreal estate there. City-sized shopping malls were erected in the blink of an eye, and storefronts spread across the planets like time-lapse footage of mold devouring an orange. Urban development had never been so easy. In addition to the billions of dollars GSS raked in selling land that it didn't actually exist, they made a killing selling virtual objects and vehicles. The Oasis became such an integral part of people's day-to-day -day lives that users were more than willing to shell out real money to buy accessories for their avatars. Clothing, furniture, houses, flying cars, magic swords, and machine guns. These items were nothing but ones and zeros stored on the Oasis servers, but they were also status symbols. Most items only cost a few credits, but since they cost nothing for a GS system manufacturer, it was all profit. Even in the throes of the ongoing economic crisis, economic recession, the Oasis allowed Americans to continue to engage in their favorite pastime, shopping. The Oasis quickly became the single most popular use for the internet. 
so much so that the term oasis and internet gradually became synonymous. And the incredibly easy to use three dimensional oasis OS, which GSS gave away for free, became the single most popular computer operating system in the world. Before long, billions of people around the world were working and playing in the Oasis every day. Some of them met, fell in love, and got married without ever setting foot on the same continent. The lines of distinction between a person's real identity and that of their avatar began to blur. It was the dawn of a new era, one where most of the human race now spent all of their free time inside of a video game.